Tonight, the NRA backpedaling off a comment it made about members of a gun rights group who were protesting the right to carry their weapons in public. They walked into a Texas Chipotle restaurant with assault rifles strapped on their backs. And I can't believe I'm asking this, did they go too far? And we will head to Wisconsin where two 12-year-old girls are accused of stabbing their so-called friend 19 times. Authorities say they planned the attack after being motivated by a fictional internet character, young girls being charged as adults. Does the punishment fit the crime regardless of age and how young is too young to try someone as an adult? Our legal panel will weigh in on that story and new video just released showing the controversial swap that the U.S. made with terrorists for prison of war. After five years in captivity, the Taliban released Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl to the U.S. in exchange for some of their top leaders being held at Gitmo. Bergdahl's fellow troops say he deserted his post and was then taken hostage. Some troops died searching for him. Should he be tried for his allegedly abandoning his post. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to get to our legal panel and a host of legal issues in just a few minutes. But to begin tonight's show, we're going to throw out the format for just a little bit. And instead of just talking over a lot of the big issues of the day here, we're going to present a couple stories on two topics we cover at length here on this program. And then we're going to have some quieter than normal conversations. And first up, Guns. Obviously, we've talked so much about this over the years, and especially after Newtown, the national debate that was long overdue that we had and really with very little resolution. And when tonight, though, what we will do is not talk about a school shooting, but instead about a gun case, where even the NRA say that gun owners may have gone too far. At least they did. That was till the NRA backed off and, in fact, threw up their arms, trying to keep our nation's most outlandish gun owners happy and keep them quiet. It's a story I couldn't believe it when I heard it and here to tell us more about it is senior political correspondent Andrew Whitman. And Andrew, I guess the best way when we saw this story, because it's not the top story above the fold in the papers today, but both of the stories we're going to be talking about today, they're kind of those moments where you sit back and say, really? Really we're debating this anymore in this country? And I think the story that you pointed out in the editorial this meeting this morning that we'll see in a second is exhibit A for that. Well, and, and I would ask everybody at home, what would you do? How would you react if on your lunch break you headed out to Chipotle or Starbucks or some other fast food place and saw people with automatic weapons standing there in the store? That's exactly what happened May 17th in Dallas. Pro-gun advocates from the group Open Carry Texas walked into a Chipotle armed to the teeth, an exercise, they say, to protect their Second Amendment rights. Other protesters did the same thing at a jack-in-the-box restaurant in El Paso in early May. Three guys with rifles ordering lunch. Late August, it was Starbucks as the target. All three chains have now asked but not required that people not come into their stores openly carrying weapons. As we mentioned, the stores later asked gun owners not to come into their stores. But amazingly, the NRA also said the demonstrations went too far, and they did so in surprising fashion, calling the idea of carrying rifles into stores and restaurants rare, downright weird and downright scary. They're italics from the NRA's own blog post. The NRA called the protests counterproductive for the gun-owning community and said that openly carrying weapons into stores and restaurants, quote, not only defies common sense, it shows a lack of consideration and manners. A surprise, to say the least, from the NRA of all people. But then that protest group in Texas complained that the NRA was being too tough on gun owners and threatened to leave the group over the NRA's comments. The president of Open Carry Texas, that one of those groups, telling a reporter, quote, I will rip up my NRA cards and burn my certificates on camera if they don't change their stance. The head of a similar group, Texas Carry, threatened to find a more pro-gun group than the NRA, saying, quote, we will actively try to move people from the NRA to gun owners of America or another alternative. And then, like the smaller gun at a duel, the NRA backed down calling the online comments a mistake and today retracting the comments altogether, saying, quote, our job isn't to criticize the lawful behavior of fellow gun owners. Rich, in those photos from the fast food places, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to place them exactly. I mean, it's, what, how would you react if you walked in and saw that? Uh, you know, I took my kids in a Chipotle, uh, granted not in Texas, but in the metropolitan area, grab a burrito, make a quick dash. The idea that some guy's going to have an M16 strapped to his back or an AR-15 or whatever it is, 
and they're offended when people call that odd. You know, we always say art imitating life here. Well, you got to go back to the early 90s. And for those uh, younger who may not remember, this movie, Falling Down, Michael Douglas with a crew cut, um, the idea that that somehow could be replicated, minus the gunfire here, in real life would have been considered, trust me, uh, you go back to the early 90s, and somebody said this could be real life, they would have laughed you out of town. If you need a little refresher, here's a clip. You have to order something from the lunch menu. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. You're good! Well, eat your lunch, please. Eat your lunch. You all need your vitamins, A's and B's and... It's an accident. It's an accident. That the trigger, it's sensitive. Accidents happen. Uh, but I'm telling you, I remember if somebody said a guy would walk into a fast food place with a semi-automatic weapon, people would have said, yeah, in Hollywood maybe. But now the NRA backs down when they say a vo just a singular voice of reason to say, guys, this isn't helping anyone's argument. Well, and then... It doesn't end there, does it? It begs the question of whether there is a too far in all of this. I mean, if you're going to walk into a Chipotle or to a Jack in the Box with a gun strapped to your back, how far do you go? What about what about public rallies? After Gabby Giffords was shot uh, a couple of years ago, they had a, 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 an anti-gun rally in Phoenix, Texas, or Phoenix, Arizona. And there's a, a photo that we have of it. There were armed protesters who showed up for Gun Appreciation Day, a counter-argument. And if that's not bad enough... And again, just remind you, this is when the sitting congressman was gunned down at a public event. And we were saying, my gosh, when, when representatives of this country can't speak in broad daylight without fear of getting shot, this is how this group chose to protest. This is discussion that maybe we've gone too far. And, and if that's not enough, a few years earlier, when President Obama went to Phoenix, he, there were a protester there that we've seen this picture before. That's a protester outside the President of the United States in a town hall. He was outside the, legal. outside the security perimeter, completely legal, quote unquote, exercising his Second Amendment right. And, you know, we were talking this morning about trying to figure out what this looked like. We came up with the movie uh, uh, Falling Down. I started thinking about those shots that we saw of the people in the restaurants. The closest that I can come to them are some, from war zones overseas. And, and we put a couple of photos together just to compare what we're seeing in the United States to what we're seeing in places like the Ukraine, or what we're seeing in Yemen, and, it, and we'll, we'll throw those up, but, and Afghanistan, we'll, and we'll, we'll start there. It's, I mean, the shots aren't that dissimilar from one another, and we'll just scroll through and, and, and show you the, the rest of these photos. But, you know, you expect to see people posing with weapons like this in public where people are transacting business and walking down the street in a war zone, not in a place like the United States of America. It, it's hard to believe. And, and listen, they're good and decent people can have a debate um, as to what the Founding Fathers ever intended by the Second Amendment. Uh, Andrew and I feel very strongly about it one way, but I respect the healthy debate that we've had in this country, especially after Newtown. But the idea that we accept that you can walk in at noontime with an assault weapon on your back and order a burrito and be offended that somebody would be taken aback by that, we have jumped a shark in many ways. And that the NRA would be so feckless about this that for the first right. time in forever, they would actually try to be, sound a voice of reason or sound a, a note of caution for their own sake, not for the well-being of people, but for the sake of their cause, and then back down from it because it, it's they're, the they're not being it's pro the enough. It's the that's defining now uh, the main, and that you said it before, that there isn't enough of a spine. They knew what was right and what was wrong, and they said so in that first posting. Okay, an issue we talked about last night, and it got heated, and I really think there was more um, really heat than light, if you will. It really wasn't about the substance. We just got into the back and forth. But minimum wage, and trust me, it's not just at the state level. This is going to be a national issue in even these midterm elections. Okay, right now, the national minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. That translates to about 15 grand a year. 40 hours a week, full-time employee, 15 grand a year. The president, he wants to raise it to $10.10 an hour, or roughly $21,000 a year. Again, 2014, full day, full week's work here, Translate over an annual period to $21,000. I don't think anyone at home is going to tell me that's a palatial amount of money to live in today's day and age. Now, this week, the city council in Seattle 
they went further. They voted to raise their minimum wage to $15 an hour, and that translates to $31,000 a year. And there's a lot of hue and cry that this will be the end of business as we know it in America if we went so far. Well, it's hard to articulate this. I think people have strong opinions one way or the other, but I wanted to try a little bit of context about this. Um, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but first, what I wanted you to do was to hear from people where this isn't just a philosophical debate, but this is their lives. These are minimum wage and other low income earners here, workers, talking for themselves. Just clips from an online video posted by Walmart workers. These are actual people who work at Walmart, all of whom make less than $10.10 an hour. At Walmart, it's a choice between paying our rent or getting our car fixed to get to work. In 37 years, my husband and I have never been able to take a vacation. I was scared to tell my manager I was pregnant. I work two jobs, I still can't afford it. I did choose between paying rent and going to the doctor. I did a salary manager's job and was paid $9.80 an hour. They may have all the money in the world, but they can't buy my hope. They can't take that away from me. Listen, uh, I am a capitalist. Uh, I believe in it in every fiber of my body that uh, we have the best system. However, the CEO in Walmart one hour makes more than these folks make in an entire year. But more than that, Andrew, I remember uh, right around the holidays, remember where there were uh, a video taken where they were trying to raise food donations for full-time workers at Walmart because they couldn't put food on the table they during the holiday season. They, they had, had to hand drive for their own employees in the back of the Walmart. And then it got public and they pulled it down. It shouldn't be that hard to have a living, not a good living, but a living and work full time. We people on the right have gotten on, get off your you know what here, get a job, stop being lazy. They're working. They're putting in a full week's work. And they still can't get enough food in many cases to put food on the table. Forget about college fund or any of those pipe dreams. It just shouldn't be that hard. And I think people ought to be really careful here if we keep making the gap bigger and bigger, because we're going to have trouble in this country if we keep it up. Two, two quick points. One is that most of these people wind up on public assistance. They wind up on food stamps or even on welfare while they're working for these low-income jobs. So people talk about getting off the public dole. These companies are actually putting their workers on the public dole. So it actually would save taxpayers money in the long run, in addition to being the humane thing to do. Second point was one I wanted to make last night. For years, we had the strongest economy in the world because we had the strongest middle class in the world. And we did that because uh, labor workers, not the greatest education, but people who graduated high school or maybe didn't, could do muscle jobs, work on assembly lines, work in steel mills. Those jobs are gone. The last refuge for people who don't have that higher education is the service sector, places like Walmart, places like Best Buy, th those kinds of stores, the supermarket. Um, and we're not paying them enough to replace the middle class earnings that we had from the, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, yep. which was the, the bulwark of our economy. If you care about the broader economy, if you want to put money in one place that you know will get recirculated back in the economy, put it in the pockets about people that have to spend the money, that have to put the food on the table, that have to pay the electric bills, that have to do the basic stuff here. If you want money back in the economy, take all the morality out of this, there's where you put it. And right now, that's where we're not. Okay, coming up next, we take a look back. Andrew and I take a look at the people who made history. Today, 25 years ago, it was a huge event, and coming up at the end of the week, it will be 70 years since a historic event on a global level. Tiananmen Square, the man who remains the iconic image tank man, a man whose name, believe it or not, still remains unknown to this day, and then, of course, D-Day. On Friday, it will mark that historic day of an invasion that not only changed a war, but changed the world. The men who became soldiers, who became heroes, sharing their stories of that historic moment.